Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 7, The Sorting House The door swung open at once. A tall, black-haired witch in emerald green robes stood there. She had a very stern face, and Harry's first thoughts were, was that she was not someone to cross. First year's Professor McGonagall, said Hagrid. Um, thank you, Hagrid. I'll take them from here. She pulled the door wide. The entrance hall was so big you could have fitted the whole of the Dursley's house in it. The stone walls were lit with flaming torches like the ones at Gringotts. The ceiling was too high to make out, and a magnificent marble staircase faced them to face them led up to the upper, upper floors. They followed Professor McGonagall across, across the flagstone floor. He, Harry could hear the drone of hundreds of voices from a doorway to the right, but the rest of the school must um, already be here. But Professor McGonagall showed the first years into a small empty chamber off the hall. They crowded in. Spen standing rather closer together than they usually would have done, peering about nervously. Welcome to Hogwarts, said Professor McGonagall. The start of term banquet will begin soon, but before you take your seats in the Great Hall, you must be sorted into your houses. The sorting is a very important ceremony because, while you are here, your house will be something like your family within Hogwarts. You will have classes with the rest of your house, sleep, with your, sleep in your house dormitory, and spend your free time in your house common room. The four houses are called Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Each house has its own noble history. Each has produced outstanding witches and wizards. While you are at Hogwarts, um, your triumphs will earn your house points, while your rule break, any rule breaking will lose house points. At the end of the year, the house with the most points will be awarded the House Cup. A great honour. I hope each of you will be a credit to whichever house becomes yours. The sorting ceremony will take place in a few minutes in the front in front of the rest of the school. I suggest you smarten yourself up whilst you are waiting. Her eyes lingered for a moment on Neville's cloak, which was fastened under his left ear, and on Ron's smudged nose. Harry nervously tried to flatten his hair. I shall return when we are ready for you, said Professor McGonagall. Please wait quietly. Uh, she left the change chamber. Harry swallowed. How, do, how exactly do they sort us into houses, he asked Ron. Some sort of test, I think. Fred said it hurts a lot, but I think he was joking. Harry's heart gave a horrible jolt. A test in front of the school. I didn't... But he didn't know any magic yet. What on earth would he have to do? He hadn't expected something like this the moment they arrived. Harry looked around anxiously. Um, and saw that everyone else was looking terrified too. No one was talking much except for Hermione Granger who was whispering very fast about all the spells she had learned, wondering which one she'd need. Harry tried hard not to listen to her. He'd never been more nervous. Never. Not even when he had had to take a school report home to the Dursley, saying somehow they'd turned, he'd turned his teacher's wig blue. He kept his eyes fixed on the door. Any second now, Pref Professor McGonagall would come back and lead him, into, lead him to his doom. Then something happened which made him scream, jump about a foot in the air. Several people behind him screamed, What the? He gasped. So did the people around him. About twenty ghosts had just streamed through the back wall. Pearly white and transparent, they glided across the room talking to each other, hardly glancing at the first years. They seemed to be arguing. What looked like a fat monk said, Forgive and forget. I say, we ought to give him a second chance. My dear friar... Haven't we given Peeves all the chance he says he deserves? He gives us all a bad name, you know. He's not really even a ghost. I say, what are you doing here? A ghost wearing rough, wearing a rough and tights had hardly noticed the first years. Nobody answered. New student, said the fry, fat fry, smiling around them. All about to be sorted, I suppose. Um, a few people nodded mutely. Hope to see you in Hufflepuff, said the friar. My old house, you know. Move along now, said a sharp voice. The sorting ceremony is about to start. Professor McGonagall had returned. One by one, the ghosts floated away through the opposite wall. Now form a line, said Professor McGonagall, and follow me. Feeling oddly as though his legs had turned to lead, Harry got into a line behind a boy with sandy hair. With Ron behind him, they walked out of the chamber, back across the hall, towards the double pairs, the pair of double doors into the great hall. Harry had never imagined such a strange and splendid place. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles which were floating mid-air, 
over four long tables, where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where the teachers were sitting. Professor McGonagall led the first years up there, so they came to a halt um, in the in a line facing the other students, with the teachers behind them. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flickering candlelight. Dotted here and there among the students, the ghost shone misty silver. Mainly avoiding the stary, staring eyes, Harry looked upward and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. He heard Hermione whisper, It's bewitched to look like the sky outside. I've read about it in Hogwarts, a history. It was hard to believe that there was a ceiling there at all. It simply looked like the great end. The great hall didn't simply open into the heavens. Harry quickly looked down again as Professor McGonagall gently, silently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years. On top of it, she put a pointed wizard's hat. This hat was patched and frayed and extremely dirty. Aunt Pacini wouldn't have let it in the house. Maybe they had to try and get a rabbit out of it, Harry thought wildly. Would that seemed the sort of thing, noticing that everybody in the hall was now staring at the hat. He stared at it too. For a, for a few seconds, there was complete silence. Then the hat tw twitched. A rip near the brim opened wide like a mouth and the hat began to sing. Oh, you may not think that I'm pretty, but don't judge what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find me, a smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowlers black. And your top hat sleek and tall. But I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat. I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head. The horsing, sorting hat can't see. So try me on and tell you where you ought to be. You may belong to Gryffindor. Well dwell the brave at heart. Their daring nerve and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. You might belong to Hufflepuff. Where they, are, where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. Or yet in wise old Ravenclaw. If you are a ready mind... Are those of wit and learning you will uh, will always find their kind or perhaps in slytherin you'll make your real friends those cunning folk use any means to achieve their ends so put me on don't be afraid don't get in a flap you're in safe hands though i have none for i am a thinking cap the whole hall burst into applause as the hat finished its song it bowed to each of the four tables then be quiet became quiet quite still again so we've got to try on we've just got to try on the hat Ron whispered to Harry. I'll kill Fred. He was going to he was going on about wrestling a troll. Harry smiled weakly. Yes. Trying on the hat is a lot better than having to do a spell, but he did wish they could have tried it on without everyone watching. The hat seemed to be asking rather a lot. Um Harry didn't feel brave or quick witted, or any of it at the moment. If only the hat had mentioned a house for people who felt a bit queasy, that would have been the one for him. Professor McGonagall now stepped forward, holding a long roll of parchment. When I call your name, you'll put on the hat and sit on the stool to be sorted. She said, Abbot Hannah, a pink faced girl with blonde pigtails, stumbled out of line, put on the hat, which fell right down over her eyes, sat down and a moment's pause. Hufflepuff, shouted the hat. The table on the right cheered and clapped as Hannah went to sit down at the Hufflepuff table. Harry saw that the ghost of the fat friar um, waving merrily at her. Bones, Susan, Hufflepuff, shouted the hat again. Susan scuttled off to sit next to Hannah. Boot, Terry, Ravenclaw. The table second from the left clapped this time. Several Ravenclaws stood up to shake hands with Terry as he joined them. Brucklehurst Mandy went to Ravenclaw too, but Brown Lavender became the first new Gryffindor, and the table on the far left exploded with cheers. Harry could see Ron's twin brother's cat calling. Bullstrode Millicent then became a Slytherin. Perhaps it was Harry's imagination after he'd heard about a lot about Slytherin, but he thought they looked an unpleasant lot. He was starting to feel definitely sick now. He remembered being picked for teams during sport lessons at his old school. He had always been the last to be chosen, not because he was no good, but because no one wanted Dudley to think they liked him. Finch Fletchley, Justin. Hufflepuff. Sometimes Harry noticed that the hat shouted out the house at once, but others it took a little time to decide. Finnegan Seamus, Seamus, the sandy-haired boy next to Harry in the line, sat on the stool for almost a whole minute before the hat declared him in a in a in Gryffindor. 
Granger, Hermione almost ran. Hermione almost ran to the stall and jammed the hat eagerly on her head. Gryffindor shouted the hat. Ron groaned. A horrible thought struck Harry. As horrible thoughts always do when you're nervous. What if he wasn't chosen at all? What if he just sat there with the hat um, over his eyes for ages until Professor McGonagall jerked it off his head and said there had been an obvious mistake and he'd better get back on the train? When Neville Longbottom, the boy who kept losing his toad, was called, he fell over on the way to his school. The hat finally took a long time with Neville. Then it finally shouted, Gryffindor! He, still, he ran off, um, still wearing it and had to jog back amid gales of laughter to give it to MacDougall Morag. Malfoy swaggered forward when his name was called and got his wish at once. The hat had barely touched its head when it screamed, Slytherin! Malfoy went to join his friends, Crab and Goyle, looking pleased with himself. There weren't many people left now. Moon, Not, Parkinson, then a pair of twins, Patil and Patil, then Perks, Sal Perks, Sally Ann, and then, at last, Potter, Harry. As Harry stepped forward, whispers suddenly broke out like hissing fires all over the hall. Potter, did she say? The Harry Potter. The last thing Harry saw before um, the hat dropping over his eyes was the hat f was the hall full of people craning to get a good look at him. Next second, he was looking at the black inside of the hat. He waited. Hmm, said a small voice in his ear. Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind either. There's talent. Oh my goodness. Yes, a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now, that's interesting. Where shall I put you? Harry grabbed the edges of the stall and thought, Not Slytherin, not Slytherin. Not Slytherin, eh? said the small voice. You sure? You could be great, you know. It's all there in your head, and Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness. No doubt about that. No? Well, if you're sure, better be Gryffindor! Harry heard the hat shout the last word to the whole hall. He took off the hat and walked shakily towards the Gryffindor table. He was so relieved to have been chosen and not put in Slytherin. He hardly noticed that he was getting the loudest cheer yet. Percy, the prefect, um, got up and shook his hand vigorously, while the Weasley twins yelled, We got Potter! We got Potter! Harry sat down opposite the ghost and the rough it seemed earlier. Um, he, the ghost patted his arm, giving Harry the sudden cold feeling he had just plunged into a bucket of ice-cold water. Harry could see the high table properly now, and at the end nearest him sat Hagrid, who caught his eye and gave him a thumbs up. Harry grinned back, and there, at the centre of the high table, in a large gold chair, sat Albus Dumbledore. Harry recognised him at once from the card he'd got out of the chocolate frog on the train. Dumbledore's silver hair was the, almost the only thing in the whole hall that shone as brightly as the ghosts. Harry spotted Professor Quirrell too, the nervous young man from the Leaky Cauldron. He was looking very peculiar in a large purple turban. And now there were only three people left to be sorted. Turpin, Lisa, became a Gryffindor. Then it was Ron's turn. He was pale green now. He Harry crossed his fingers under the table, and uh, a second later the hat shouted, Gryffindor! Harry clapped loudly with the rest as Ron collapsed onto the chair next to him. Well done, Ron. Excellent, said Percy Weasley pompously as Harry, across Harry as Zambini Blaze made a Slytherin. Professor McGonagall rolled up her scroll and took the sorting hat away. Harry was now looking down at his empty gold plate. He had only just realised how hungry he was. The pumpkin pasty seemed ages ago. Albus Dumbledore got to his feet. He was beaming at the students, his arms open wide, as if nothing could have pleased him more than to see them all there. Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And here they are. Nitwit, blubber, oddment, tweak. Thank you. Harry, he sat back down. Everybody clapped and cheered. Harry didn't know whether to laugh or not. Is he a bit mad? He asked Percy uncertainly. Mad? said Percy airily. He's a genius, best wizard in the world. But he is a bit mad, yes. Potatoes, Harry? Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with food. He'd never seen so many things he liked to eat on one table before. Roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops, lamb chops, sausages, bacon and steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, chips... Yorkshire pudding, peas, carrots, gravy, and ketchup, and for some strange reason, mint humbugs. 
The Dursley had never starved Harry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Dudley had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with every bit of a bit of everything except the humbugs and began to eat. It was delicious. That does look good, said the ghost in the rough, sadly, watching Harry cut up the steak. Can't you? I haven't eaten in nearly 500 years, said the ghost. I don't need to, of course, but one does miss it. I don't think I've introduced myself. Sir Nicholas Mimsy Porpington at your service, resident ghost of the Gryffindor Tower. I know who you are, said Ron suddenly. My brother's told me about you. You're nearly headless Nick. I would prefer you call me Sir Nicholas de Mimsy. The ghost began stiffly, but Sandy haired Seamus Finn Seamus Finnegan interrupted. Nearly headless. How can you be nearly headless? Sir Nicholas looked extremely miffed, as if their chat wasn't going to going at all the way he wanted. Like this, he said irritably, seized his left ear and pulled. The whole head swung off his neck and fell onto his shoulder, as if it was on a hinge. Somebody had obviously tried to behead him, but had not done it properly. It looked, looking pleased at the stunned um, looks on their faces. Nearly headless Nick flipped his head back onto his neck and coughed. So, and you Gryffindors, I hope you're going to help us win the house championship this year. Gryffindors never gone so long without winning. Slytherin have got, have got the sixth cup the cup six years in a row. The bloody baron's becoming almost unbearable. He's the Slytherin ghost. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and saw a horrible ghost sitting there with blank staring eyes, a gaunt face and robes stained with silver blood. He was right next to Malfoy who, Harry was pleased to see, didn't look too pleased with the seating arrangements. How did he get covered in blood? asked Seamus with great interest. I never asked, said nearly headless Nick delicately. When everyone had eaten as much as they could, the remains of the food faded before, faded from the plates, leaving them sparkling clean as before. A moment later, the puddings appeared, blocks of ice cream in every flavour you could think of, apple pies, treacle tarts, chocolate eclairs, and jam donuts, trifle, strawberries, jelly, rice pudding. Harry helped himself to a treacle tart, and the talk turned to their families. I am half and half, said Seamus. Me dad's a muggle. Mam didn't... Tell him she was a witch till after they were married. Bit of a nasty shock for him. The others laughed. What about you, Neville? said Ron. Well, my gran brought me up. Brought me up. She's a witch, said Neville. But the family thought I was a muggle for ages. My great uncle, Algy, kept trying to catch me off my guard and forced some magic out of me. He pushed me off the end of Blackpool Pier once. I nearly drowned, but nothing happened till I was eight. Great uncle Algy came round for tea and he was hanging me out of the upstairs window by my ankles when my great auntie Enid offered him a meringue and he accidentally let go. But I bounced all the way down to the garden and onto the road. They were all really pleased. Gran was crying. She was so happy. You should have seen their faces when I got here. They thought I might not be, ba be magic enough to come, you see. Great uncle Algy was so pleased he brought me my toad. H on Harry's other side... Percy Weasley and Hermione were talking about lessons. I do hope they start straight away. There's so much to learn. I'm particularly interested in transfiguration. You know, turning something into something else, of course. It's supposed to be very difficult. You'll be starting small, just like ma just matches into needles and that sort of thing. Harry was, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked up at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Professor McGonagall. To Professor Tumbledore, Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with greasy black hair, with a hooked nose and sha swallow skin. It seemed to happen very. It happened very suddenly. The hook-nosed teacher looked past Quirrell's turban and straight into Harry's eyes, and a sharp, hot cr pain cro shot across the scar on Harry's forehead. Ouch! Harry clasped. Clapped his hand to his forehead. What is it? asked Percy. Nothing. The pain had gone as quickly as it had come. Hardest to shake off was the feeling Harry had got from the teacher's look. A feeling that he didn't like Harry at all. Who's that teacher talking to Professor Quirrell? he asked Percy. Oh, you know Quirrell already. No longer he's looking so nervous. That's Professor Snape. He teaches potions. But he doesn't want to. Everyone knows he's after Quirrell's job. Knows an awful lot about the dark arts, Snape. Harry watched Snape for a while, but Snape didn't look at him again. At last, the puddings too disappeared, 
and Professor Dumbledore got to his feet again. The hall fell silent. Ahem. I'd had I um <clears throat> just a few more words now we're all fed and watered. I have a few start of term notices to give you. First you should note that the forest in the grounds is forbidden to all pupils. Remember and a few of our older students would do well to remember that as well. Dumbledore's eyes, twinkling eyes, flashed in the direction of the Weasley twins. I have also been asked by Mr. Filch, the caretaker, to remind you that no magic should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of term. Everyone interested in playing for the house team should contact Miss Madam Hooch. And finally, I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor on the right-hand side is out of bounds to everybody who does not wish to die a painful death. Harry laughed, but he was uh, one of the f few who did. He's not serious, he muttered to Percy. Must be, said Percy, frowning at Dumbledore. It's odd, because he usually gives us a reason why we're not allowed to go there. The forest is full of dangerous beasts, everyone knows that. I do think you might have told us, prefects at least. And now we go, before we go to bed, let's sing the school song, cried Dumbledore. Harry noticed that the other teacher's smiles had become rather fixed. Dumbledore gave his wand a flick, as if he was trying to get a fly off the end, and a long golden ribbon flew out of it, which rose high above the tables and twisted itself snake-like into words. Everybody pick their tune, said Dumbledore, and off we go. The school bellowed. Hogwarts, 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 you Hogwarts. Teach us something, please. Whether we're old and bald or young with scabby knees, our head could do with filling with some interesting stuff. For now they are bare and full of air, dead flies and bits of fluff. So teach us things worth knowing. Bring back what we forgot. Just do your best, we'll do the rest. And, until, and learn until our brains rot. Everybody finished the song at different times. At last, the only, we only the Weasley twins were left singing along to a very slow funeral march. Dumbledore conducted their last few lines with his wand, and when they had finished, he was one of those who clapped the loudest. Ah, music, he said, wiping his eyes. All magic beyond, a magic beyond all we do here. Now, bedtime, off you trot. The Gryffindor first years followed Percy through the chattering clouds, out of the great hall, up the marble staircase. Harry's legs were like lead again, but only because he was so tired and full of food. He was too sleepy even to be surprised that people in portraits along the corridors whispered and pointed as they passed, or that twice Percy led them through doorways hidden behind sliding panels and hanging tapestries. They climbed more staircases, yawning and dragging their feet, and Harry wondered how much further they had to go when they came to a sudden halt. A bundle of walking sticks was floating in mid-air ahead of them, and Percy took a step towards them, and they started throwing themselves at him. Peeves, Percy whispered to the first year, a uh, poltergestus, he raised his voice. Peeves, show yourself. A loud, rude sound, like the air being let out of a balloon, whispered, answered, Do you want me to go get the bloody baron? There was a pop, and a little man with dark with wicked dark eyes and a wide mouth appeared, floating cross-legged in the air, clutching walking sticks. Ooh, he said with an evil cackle. Equal first years, what fun! He swooped suddenly at them. They all ducked. Go away, Peeves, or the Baron will hear about this. I mean it, p barked Percy. Peeves stuck out his tongue and vanished, dropping the walking sticks on Neville's head. They heard him zooming away, rattling coats of armour as he passed. You want to watch out for Peeves, said Percy, as they set off again. The bloody Baron's the only one who can control him. They don't even listen to us prefects. Here we are. Um, at the very end of the corridor hung a portrait of fat, of very fat women. Sorry. Of a very fat woman in a pink silk dress. Password, she said. Caput Draconis, said Percy, and the... Portrait swung forward to reveal a round hole in the wall. They all scrambled through it. Neville needed a leg up and found themselves in the Gryffindor common room, a cosy round room full of squashing armchairs. Percy directed the girls through one door to their dormitory and the boys through another. At the top of the spiral staircase, there were um, they were obviously in one of the towers. They found their beds at last. Five, four posters... Five four posters hung with deep velvet, red velvet curtains. Their trunks had already been brought up. Too tired to talk much, they pulled on their pyjamas and fell into bed. Great food, isn't it? Ron muttered to Harry through the hangings. 
Get off, Scabbers. He's chewing my sheets. Harry was going to ask Ron if it had any of the treacle, char- treacle tart, but he fell asleep almost at once. Perhaps Harry had eaten too much because he had a very strange dream. He was wearing Professor Quirrell's turban, which kept talking to him, telling him he must transfer to Slytherin at once because it was his destiny. Harry told the turban he didn't want to be in Slytherin. It got heavier and heavier and he tried to pull it off, but it tightened painfully and there was Malfoy laughing at him as she struggled with it. Then Malfoy turned to the hook-nosed teacher, Snape, whose laugh became high and cold. There was a burst of green light and Harry woke. Sweating and shaking, he rolled over and fell asleep again. Then, when he woke the next day, he couldn't remember the dream at all. 